Okay. Hi, everybody. It's now noon on the East Coast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I'm joined by two of my One Schoolhouse colleagues. Uh, Jasper McElrath is our director of operations here uh, at One Schoolhouse, and he will be helping answer and monitor our Q&A as we go through today's session. So for uh, those of you unfamiliar with the Zoom platform, one of the things to know is in a webinar format, you are not on camera. Um, the only people that are on camera right now are Jasper and Liz and me. Liz, I'll let introduce herself in just a second. Um, uh, and we'll be answering everybody's questions through the Q&A button. So click that Q&A button if you have a question as we go through this today. And, uh, and feel free to post your questions there. Jasper will uh, interrupt Liz and I as we, uh, as we start in this presentation as appropriate, and we'll also be saving a lot of those questions towards the end. Uh, and for those of you that didn't join right before the noon hour, also know that we're recording this webinar so that we can post it to our YouTube page later today, and you can share it out from there. At the end of the session too, we'll be making sure that you know of all the things that, all the resources that we currently have, and probably giving you some uh, some uh, heads up on things that we're thinking about for future weeks too. Okay, Liz, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself too? Sure, hi everybody, I'm Liz Cates. I'm the Director of School and Student Support at One Schoolhouse, which means that I manage student performance and progress and also work closely um, with our schools um, to make sure that we're that information between what's happening online filters into uh, schools regular operating processes um, like many of you i am sure um, i am now not just working remotely i am also homeschooling my two fourth graders and i will tell you that i have never been more grateful for classroom teachers and i include the years that i was one so um, for those of you who are balancing um, having your work literally come home with you um, thank you we know it's not easy um, and uh, and there are countless parents in your community who can't even tell you how much they now appreciate and understand the work you do uh, Liz I'm so glad you started with that and I think that that is going to lead into some of the uh, suggestions that we have for schools here really really fast okay um, so we're gonna get started here I'm gonna share my screen and we're going to go through um, just some baseline practical steps for academic leaders related to coronavirus and honestly also some forward thinking things towards uh, uh, future outbreaks and challenges that we may have. Um, we're going to try to run through this in 20 to 30 minutes so that we really reserve time that you have uh, for the questions that you have, knowing that those are really important. And at the end of this time, I'm also going to make sure that you have uh, information on how to schedule a 30 minute call with me to talk through your school specific circumstances. We know that there are really a whole bunch of different variables that go into play uh, as you're creating your plan at school. Um, and so uh, uh, we know it may be helpful to just talk for 30 minutes about uh, school specific circumstances. Um, we have three overriding principles to the suggestions that we have, especially for the phase that we're in right now. Um, the first is to be calm and pause. Uh, your, your communities are looking to you as administrators and teachers to be leaders in this situation. And as leaders in this situation, we need to make sure that we are just projecting calm and, uh, and pause. Most of you are coming from one schoolhouse schools too. Uh, and I'll tell you uh, that one of the messages we've been giving to our schools is in some sense, you just got this. You already have had students who have taken online classes at your school. You've started to think about what that support needs to be for students who are taking online classes. Um, so have some sense of, of, of understanding that that, that you've done this in a way uh, that other schools have not. And Liz, I'm sure people will have questions for you in that regard as we talk about what it looks like to support kids in an online learning environment as we go along. Sure. Yeah, and, and second piece of advice is just to be straightforward and clear. Clarity is your friend in a crisis situation. Um, you don't want to confuse the message. You don't want to have people giving multiple messages. And we'll talk about that, what that means, especially for classroom teachers here in a few minutes. And the third overriding principle is to create simple solutions. Don't try to be complex and don't let perfect be the enemy of the good in this situation. 
you are trying to create a simple continuity plan, um, especially again, as you start uh, creating distance learning options for your students and families. You can always make things more complex and you can always tweak those programs as you go through week by week by week or on a bi-weekly bi basis. But if you start with something complex, it's gonna create some problems. So be really simple here right at the start. So what does this start look like? Oh, actually, before I do that, I wanna let you know that all of these resources that we're having, this probably, probably this webinar is gonna to start to live over there, uh, et cetera, are up on our One Schoolhouse COVID-19 page. And that's just oneschoolhouse.org slash COVID-19 at HTML. So please feel free to use it as a resource. Um, Liz and Jasper and I are updating this thing on a very, very regular basis right now. So we see really three phases to the response. Um, the first phase is getting backpack ready, although we may have already uh, gone past that, uh, and the move to distance learning. And you'll hear um, Liz and Jasper and me talk about distance learning here, not online learning. I'll explain the distinction in a second. Phase two, we're really talking about establishing regular communication standards uh, and channels, setting baseline LMS guidelines and starting to make adjustments. And then phase three is after this kind of, uh, after we can start to, to take a pause and reflect on the situation, reflecting and preparing for future closures. Obviously at this point, almost all of us are really knee deep into phase one. So let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, it's um, maybe not funny is the right word, uh, but uh, it's kind of odd that uh, 10 days ago when we did webinars like this, it was clear that we were telling people, please, please, please start setting your backpack ready expectations. We know that almost everybody in this room now is probably at a point where we can't do that anymore. Uh, hopefully you did set some in your backpack expectations for students and teachers so that everybody was bringing as many materials as they possibly could home. Um, so that they had as many resources as they possibly could under uh, their roof. The second is to make sure that you have access to a digital video platform. Most schools right now are using Zoom or GoToMeeting or Microsoft Teams or Google Hangout Meet, um, any one of those platforms right now, uh, and making sure that their teachers know how to use that platform. Um, that's been kind of priority number one for a lot of schools. We think that that is an absolutely uh, essential priority number one. And the reason for that is that, again, we are moving to a distance learning scenario, not an online learning scenario. So what's the difference? What's the distinction between the two? In distance learning, you're taking the same pedagogical approaches and moving them to their online or remote learning equivalents. In online learning, we're rethinking time and space to take advantage of the medium very differently. What this means is that in a distance learning scenario, you're gonna want to have synchronous class meetings, particularly for grades, I would say four and above, and some schools maybe six and above, somewhere around there. Um, but you're gonna wanna have synchronous meetings for your kids, just as you would during a typical school day. That's the easiest way for you to move to a distance learning scenario you're probably not thinking, especially at the start, about asynchronous opportunities. That varies a little bit school by school, depending upon the type of training that you have done with your faculty, but as a general rule, we would encourage you to plan to run your school according to a schedule that very closely mimics the type of schedule that you would have um, for face-to-face -face learning. That's going to allow teachers to basically have uh, classes the way that they have been used to having classes, albeit through a different medium. Again, we're trying to stay simple here at the start. And so uh, some, with simplicity being your friends, if we're changing from one medium to another, that's easier than rethinking a whole pedagogy, which is something we don't want to do. I'll pause there and also tell you that at one schoolhouse, when we move great independent school faculty members from being great face-to-face -face teachers to being online learning teachers, we take six months to train them. You don't have six months. You got a week maybe to get this program ready or two. So really think carefully about the tools that you are asking your teachers um, uh, to work through. Um, the next thing is uh, uh, to make sure that you are setting aside future time for faculty and staff 
uh, for faculty and staff meetings. That is already plan to know that you're going to be making some tweaks along the way and set aside time for future faculty trainings two weeks out, four weeks out, six weeks out, etc. The next recommendation I know is going to be a little bit controversial for folks. And that is to think about and consider reserving your specialist teachers at this point. In other words, not moving special classes in uh, art, uh, PE, some other areas to the online format, to the distance learning format yet. There are two reasons for this. One, um, it's a little bit more complicated probably for to move some of those classes to a distance learning scenario. And you might want some more time for training and consideration of that. Two, we may very quickly realize that we are in a situation where we need a lot of substitute teachers. That's not fun to say. However, if you need, are in a situation where you're going to need a lot of substitute teachers, you may want to reserve your special teachers for, uh, to be substitutes in the future, especially if you can train them up a bit now. And then the third thing, uh, the third thing, third reason for thinking about that is at the beginning to keep this simple you may want to just move the core of your academic program uh, to the online learning space and finally again i'm going to probably say this a couple more times do not let perfect be the enemy of good in this situation in independent schools we are a kind of perfectionist class of people um, we got to check that tendency right now we're not going to be able to solve for every problem here at the start and we've got to acknowledge that to our families and our students right away into our faculty. Brad, can so, I just say two things before we move on? Sorry, please. real fast. Um, the first is that we know that um, also, you know, our expertise is in working largely with, mostly with high school students and to some extent with middle school students. And for those of you who are in K-12s or K-8s, that this can, that this can look really differently because as is appropriate, you're taking into account the developmental needs of your students. Um, and so we're going to be talking about one model. It's not the only model, it's, but we also will address specifically what, what that might look like for other people. Um, Absolutely. And Liz, we've got a slide in here now on that too. Fantastic. And then the last thing I just want to say about Backpack Ready is um, that I live um, in the Bay Area. And so those of you um, who've been following the news may notice that we're in what's called shelter in place. Um, what I want to tell you is that when those, um, when those uh, orders come down from your local government, they will happen very quickly. Um, and so when you think about Backpack Ready, you're also going to want to think about not just about having the materials you need, but the kinds of things that may need care at school. Um, so things like classroom animals or science experiments. Um, so as we, as, we go fat, as we go further into uh, managing what moving a school out of a building and on, into a distance learning model may look like, um, you'll want to think about some of those things that um, that will become um, urgent and important very quickly, even though they don't operate that way in your daily life. Thanks, Liz. Those are those are two really uh, think, important things to keep in mind. So, what might this look like for a middle and upper school student? It probably looks something a little bit like this, right? Where you're simplifying your schedule down a little bit. You're absolutely building in some of those community touch points that we are so good at in independent schools during the course of our weeks. So make sure to build in all school assembly, make sure to build in advisory, make sure to build in your class meetings and all of those other social emotional touch points. You may want to build into that initial schedule, just check in time available with your health counselor and things like that, or just publishing the office hours for your counselors. Um, and team on that level. And then for classes, you're going to want to distribute a schedule that gives kids the easy way to connect to those classes. These days, I would actually say, if I was redoing this schedule that I put together on my computer one day, I'd probably actually put in here also the conference meeting line. So when you choose a, uh, a platform to use for your video conferences, you're going to want to make sure that it's really accessible in three different ways. Most of you we know are connecting to the Zoom platform today via your computer. However, some of you are connecting via an app on your phone. And others of you we know are just calling in 
that's all appropriate and allows us to make sure that this platform is accessible to a wide range of people. The same thing is going to want to happen in your classes. You may have kids who are able to just click that button and go right into the video conference, but you may have kids who are only able to access that class via an app on the phone or just calling in. We also know, particularly with younger students, we can talk specifically about younger students in a second, but particularly with younger students who are having care given to them, perhaps by an older sibling or by their grandparents, that we are going to want to make this as easy as possible for those kids. And the phone may become our friend in the way that we can make this accessible in a wider range. So for an upper middle school, it might look like this. The other thing to know about this, and Liz, you might want to add in two cents on this too, is that um, it's helping to establish continuity in a time of crisis for our kids. And giving them a schedule allows for us to create a sense of calm that may not exist in any other portion of their life right now. Yep, I think to that, I would add that, um, you know, you that as educators, you really are experts. And while every family is trying to figure out what's going on, they are looking to you for guidance. Um, and the more guidance you can give them about a way to create the amount of normalcy that we can for their children is so deeply appreciated. Right now, it's really unclear where you can get your reliable information. Because schools trust communities, they're going to be asking you for things, some things that you are experts on, and some things, quite frankly, that you aren't. Um, and wherever you can give them that expert reassurance, where in, in your area of expertise, um, it helps people feel settled and connected, um, and it helps make things feel just a little bit more manageable in a situation that quite frankly, doesn't feel manageable to many of us right now. Right, uh, the three of us included. <laughs> so on lower school, a lower school specific, uh, uh, specific recommendation, and Liz, of course, jump in here too. Uh, we want to make sure that you're clear with your families about what to expect. We've seen some schools send messages like, if school's closed, we're going to provide you with learning resources activities, but the volume of work will not keep students busy for the uh, number of hours they're usually in school. And they might say, it will keep kids busy for X number of hours dependent upon the school. Uh, the second thing is to consider what resources your students already have access to. Elementary students may use apps that they have uh, access to on campus like Dreambox or IXL or other things um, that you can extend access to families at home on. You can also go kind of very low tech on this stuff and think about scanning documents or putting together learning packets that can be mailed home. Uh, a little bit of that is going to be community dependent and going to be dependent upon what you've already set as expectations with your families. Some lower schools are already used to using learning management systems, for example, to connect with parents. They may find that that's their best friend for doing that. It's going to, uh, it's going to be pretty school by school dependent, um, but it's going to also, we, especially in this first phase, be uh, more in the realm of kind of packets of learning activities that parents can do with kids than it is a full academic program. That said, uh, if you're not moving to a distance learning model for elementary schools, that is, if you're not doing more, uh, a whole ton of video conferencing or audio conferencing with uh, your lower school students, consider asking families and students to do a daily audio video check-in with the teacher. Uh, this could be done in small groups, it could be done one-on-one, -on -one. The focus here would be on social emotional wellness and community rather than instruction, although that may change a little bit in weeks two, three, four, five, six, depending upon how this all starts to play out. And you might also give options for times uh, of day for students to join, knowing that home resources are spread thin for many. So you may, for example, have a uh, third grade class meetup that's available both at eight o'clock or at eight o'clock in the morning, at noon, and at five o'clock that day. Um, giving families some flexibility that they're going to need. Uh, again, Liz, I'm thinking to you here with uh, with two elementary grade kids at home right now. Yeah. The um, the other thing that I would add is that you know you don't need to know what you're doing next week right now in terms of your in terms of synchronous or asynchronous you're doing what you can do now to respond and then you can move um at, then you can move to to a, to a to an iterated plan 
Um, at the same time, for our youngest students who, you know, who are concrete, um, encourage, if you're doing an asynchronous plan, please encourage your lower school teachers to do some recorded videos. Um, it can be as simple as just reading a book out loud um, and giving and, and having those teachers post it on YouTube or Vimeo and sending the link or having them record a morning meeting message that then goes home. Seeing your teacher for students is deeply reassuring. Um, and so wherever you can do that in ways that, um, in ways that, that uh, jigsaw in with what you're planning, um, even if you're doing asynchronous, it's, um, it's a really important moment of connection for students who are feeling really at sea right now. Thanks, Liz. It's a great reminder. Um, and this really does fit into phase two. You're going to want to continue to make adjustments to your plan as you go along, establish those regular sets of communication channels. And if you haven't, if you're at a school that hasn't done this already, set baseline learning management system guidelines that everybody at school can follow. So create some guidelines for digital communication between students and teachers, set those baseline uses of the learning management system. Um, I'm going to pause and go a little bit off script here and also say something that uh, is the oddest thing for me to say. Um, for going on 13, 14 years now, I've been helping schools move to more asynchronous learning platforms and to think about online resources much more broadly than they typically do. Now I am telling schools to be really careful about adding any new technology into what they do. And I'm also advising schools to actually probably pull back your typically high-flying faculty and encourage them not to fly so far right now. You don't want, this is a time in particular where you don't want the focus to be on the technology, you want the focus to be on the learning and community. So don't add too many new resources, don't add too many new programs, don't add too many of these new things. And I would say for the administrators in the audience today, really consider having that conversation with your high-flying faculty about why it's important to have continuity at this time across the school and not be uh, trying new things out. We would say, especially in the first phase of this, you're not trying out new pedagogical approaches. And in phase two of this, you're thinking really, really carefully about the new pedagogy that you bring in. You're not adding a lot at any one time which is why it's important to continue to gather data from all of your different constituent groups about uh, the experiences that they're having and adjust regularly. At One Schoolhouse, one of the things that we do just as point of practice within our school is two weeks into the school year, we do a pretty extensive survey of our students to just understand how they're experiencing this learning for the first time. You're going to want to gather that type of data from your kids and from your families to see if what you thought you'd planned really well, even as simple, is actually is actually playing out that way um, when kids are at home. And then phase three, I'm just going to mention some of these things right now. Um, make sure that you're taking some time at the end of this whole thing to reflect on the experience and to prepare for future closings. That again, can continue to collect data from families and students on their experience. Um, at the end of this, we're gonna wanna really make sure that we have a comprehensive business continuity plan um, uh, that involves our attorneys very carefully and our insurance carriers. Uh, we're having lots of conversations with attorneys these days uh, about some of the challenges that schools are facing because they haven't been planning or their plans didn't involve attorneys on the front end of this. I would ensure to make sure I would ensure that in your faculty contracts that there is a provision in there that they must have and retain high speed internet access at home. Um, and I would also make sure that that's in your family re enrollment contracts that they have to have high speed internet access at home. And then I would also think about changing pedagogical approaches and, and retraining faculty members to take advantage of things like learning management systems to be able to do more asynchronous learning. Again, though, at this point, we're encouraging real simplicity and that move to distance learning, not online learning uh, right now. We've put together um, four different uh, uh, things this week. This is today's webinar uh, that you see the link to up there. Um, but we have other resources that we are continuing to push out to our schools 
just to be as helpful as we can given this weird uh, circumstance and given the weird place that we sit um, in, uh, in doing online classes for a long time at a high level and also doing faculty professional development. These two classes, Continuity and Crisis Planning for Administrators and Continuity and Crisis Planning for Teachers are gonna be available again next week. These are free online classes um, that we're just offering out to the community. We almost certainly are also gonna run them the last week of March slash first week of April. And I'll tell you all, we're almost certainly also gonna have 2.0 versions of these coming up in April and probably 3.0 and 4.0 coming up in May and June as we start to think through different phases of this. Um, uh, as we start to think through the different phases of this. We'll always keep up a resource page, um, oneschoolhouse.org slash COVID-19 uh, as the hub for anything that we're doing. These days we're updating that page uh, daily or every other day uh, with new resources and new, uh, new help for schools. And then finally, again, we know that a conversation may be really helpful for you and your school. Please just use that link up there um, to schedule some time with me. I'm more than happy to have conversations with you about your individual school situation. That link is also up on that COVID-19 resource page too. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, Liz and Jasper and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Jasper, do you wanna help us with questions? Brad, I'm actually gonna manage the questions remotely today. Great. Okay. Do we have any that have come in? Not yet. Or we've answered. Okay. We've answered. Um, we've answered a few of them individually. And the best place to put your question, if you have it, is to use that Q and A icon that's down towards the bottom of the screen. It's like a little rectangle with a big Q in it. Um, Brad, while we're waiting for people, can you describe a few of the questions that you're hearing from, from different schools um, and, and just sort of where, where people's thinking is right now? Yeah, you know, one thing, Liz, that, um, uh, is, that I've been hearing from boarding schools in particular is they're worried about access points for kids who are not in the U.S. They're particularly thinking about students who are in Asia. Um, and as I was talking this through with a boarding school yesterday, what became very clear is that the best time of day that you can do synchronous work with uh, schools, uh, with boarding school students who are in Asia and the US, et cetera, um, is probably from 8.30 in the morning to 11.30 in the morning East Coast time if you're an East Coast based school and, and a little bit, you have a little bit more challenging window if you're a West Coast school. Um, but for East Coast school, East Coast schools with boarding students, that 8.30 to 11.30 window is a good time to think about scheduling and prioritizing your community meets, your access of your uh, healthcare staff, um, your you know, all school meetings, grade level meetings, all that stuff. And then to think about cycling through your, uh, your synchronous class meetings during that 8.30 to 11.30 window so that every kid can see their teacher at least a couple of times a week live. If you're in a boarding school though too, you're not gonna be able to run the entire class day through the 8.30 to 11.30 window. And so you're probably asking teachers outside of that 11.30 time to be recording those lessons and putting them up online so that students in other areas of the world can access those synchronous classes. Again, not an ideal scenario, um, but we are not living um, in an ideal uh, setting right now. All right, Brad, we're starting to see some questions come in. So let me, um, let me start with the first one, which is, um, would you recommend next week's course if you want to go into more detail on distance learning? Yeah, for, for teachers, um, I, would, uh, I would really think about uh, taking that, uh, that course for teachers um, because we'll train you in three different components of distance learning. Um, the first is how to, how to create an asynchronous, or how to create a synchronous class lesson um, using a video platform. The second is to think about how to create an asynchronous assignment, an assignment that you can give to students during this, this time. And the third is uh, how to start to use discussion boards as a, uh, as a tool for asynchronous class discussions. That's kind of like beginning stages of, my guess is the 2.0 version of our teacher course will go into much more detail on that type of thing. So yes, please. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Um, we have a question here um, about, um, about sample schedules and ask if we have one for lower primary grades, say K2. 
we don't yet, but we will, we are, that's one of the things that we know we want to create. Um, and so we'll start to get some of those resources up as quickly as we possibly can and start to collect them from schools that we're hearing from. I have to say, I heard from uh, an associate head of school this morning that, that told me that they, all the way down to their two-year-olds, are doing full synchronous sessions for elementary grade kids. And so some schools are going, you know, I, I suggested that middle school, upper school, grade, especially grade four and above, you can start to do synchronous sessions all day long and we can, we'd ask you to think about that. Some schools are doing synchronous sessions all the way down to their two-year-olds though. Um, and uh, trying to create normalcy that way. Um, so we have a question here about assessment and grading. Um, and asking us to share our thinking about that, um, saying that, that we know that, that some schools may consider moving all classes to pass fail and wondering what we're hearing and, and where we might recommend. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I would encourage you uh, to, um, I would encourage a couple of things here. Uh, first, for, uh, for major assessments that faculty have been planning to do over the first couple of weeks of these challenges, I would encourage you to put a pause on this. Just in phase one, kind of getting this out there and testing this out and everybody kind of moving to this environment, ask your faculty to put a pause on assessments for the time being. And that time being for some schools might look like one week and some other schools might look like two weeks. That's okay and appropriate because it's a bit of that more kind of thorny area where you're gonna to wanna to have some experience here in this distance learning setting before being able to make really clear guidelines for your teachers on this. So I would encourage you to think about putting a pause on those major assessments right now and seeing how some of this plays out in the simple way before adding that complexity on it. That's the type of complexity I might think about adding in weeks two or three. Um, you're gonna wanna think about things like, you know, do parents proctor assessments? Do you know, you have kids sign an honor code or honor pledge at the beginning of the assessment. Those types of things um, you might want to think about. And I would also suggest everybody going back to like um, Denise Pope's research in this whole area and challenge success uh, on what's appropriate for assessments and what actually causes academic dishonesty and all of that stuff. It's going to take you a weekend to read through that stuff and, and understand the types of policies you might want to have. That's a decision I would punt on. I would also strongly advise schools, and I know that some schools have done this already, to punt on other big decisions like pass-fail. I would not go to pass-fail right now or announce that you're making that move. You don't know enough right now to make that move. And you don't know enough in two different areas. You don't know enough about how your school community is responding to the distance learning platform that you are setting up, and you don't know how outside entities who you interact with related to grades are going to view pass-fail decisions at this time. We know that everybody's gonna to band in together and be as supportive and good as we possibly can to each other. However, a lot of organizations have, uh, have uh, guidelines already related to things like pass-fail and transcripts. I'll give an example, the NCAA. Uh, has guidelines related to student athletes and pass fail uh, and pass fail work in NCAA world for a student athlete that uh, has a pass fail grade on their transcripts. The NCAA counts that pass as the lowest possible passing grade within that school. So if a school says 65 is passing for us and uh, the student has that pass grade, then they're going to count that grade as a 65. Now, they may change that, and they probably will change that, I mean, in kind of the world of reality, right? However, um, they haven't made any announcements on that. You don't know how they're gonna change that. You don't know how they're gonna view that. That's the type of thing, the type of reason that I would pause as much as I possibly can on making a decision in that area. So I'd be really careful about making decisions in areas that there are too many unknowns in, right now and instead try to create really simple solutions on our campus um, that allow for flexibility towards a whole range of options as this world starts to become a little bit clearer to us. So as our questions are coming in, we're noticing that they're really in sort of two categories, that there are some that are asking big picture questions about implementation and instruction 
and some that are asking smaller, uh, smaller focus questions about individual like lessons or lesson planning. So we're going to start with those big picture questions and then we'll Great. go through the more specific ones at the end. Um, so we have a question here about how teachers can support differentiated instruction specifically um, around learning differences. Mm -hmm. Liz, do you want to actually just jump in here with this a little bit? Because you have a lot of experience with this one. Sure. So the first thing I would say is that there are great resources being developed um, by both by advocacy organizations. Um, so, for example, um, if you're familiar with Attitude, A D D I T U D E, that does programming um, for families who have um, students with ADHD, um, they're running a webinar tomorrow on sort of managing homeschooling with students with attentional interference. Um, and so the first thing I would do is take a look at what those organizations are doing. Um, uh, understood, um, the uh, Dyslex National Dyslexia Organizations, um, because those organizations understand that their constituencies need advocacy work right now, and they're doing very good advocacy work. Um, and I would suggest once you start to find those resources, um, post them. I know most schools have put together a external facing um, uh, crisis response page or a coronavirus page. That's a great, whether that's um, external and it goes out or it's internal, say in a parent portal, that is a great place to put resources because um, families and teachers will all be looking for them. So um, encourage teachers um, to look at some of the stuff that's being created for parents um, because so much of this is individual to the child. We all know that because our kids have individual learning plans um, when they do need classroom accommodations. Um, we also had a question that was sort of related to this. Um, and so Liz, I'm going, I, yeah, go on. Can I add one other thing in there too? Yes. One of the other things that we typically do to support students with learning differences and, and to differentiate even further within independent schools is to make sure that students know that our office hours are, that we're kind of in our office all the time and absolutely wanting to help kids out during the course of the a given day. Uh, I think, Liz, we'd also encourage schools to set up office hours for their teachers, too, in addition to their synchronous class time, so that kids know this is a time I can pop in. A lot of schools we're learning are, um, are using uh, Google Calendaring features to just allow uh, teachers to set those times up and then kids to just pop in and, appoint and make appointments during those times. Yeah. So I just want to add that in as another place. Great. And then we have a related question um, that I want to answer at the same time, which is um, that uh, somebody writes in is that the, their school has opted for 30 minute classes for connection and for asynchronous time so that kids aren't spending too much time online. But there's anxiety about um, about kids being able to manage their time and faculty being able to learn the asynchronous piece. Um, so all good questions. Um, the best recommendation that I can give you about helping students to manage their time is, um, is to go old fashioned um, and go paper. Um, because having a piece of paper that you keep next to your screen because you can, looking at too many windows is a recipe for adults to go nuts. Give kids something so that they can on paper or they can copy it down onto a pad if they don't have a printer um, so that they can keep track of a checklist. Um, because you want students to be able to track their progress, to prioritize. So the more, if you can give students that information in a central place, that's really, really helpful. The younger the student is, the more important that is. Um, in terms of helping faculty learn the asynchronous part, in some ways, faculty do asynchronous work in their classrooms. You know, they give kids readings, they give kids worksheets. Um, so they know how to, how to curate material and they know what's appropriate for their students. Um, in terms of giving students opportunity, um, one of the things that really increases engagement is making sure that students have a range of, um, of different kinds of activities that they can do over the course of the week, just as you would do in your classroom. No teacher wants to have their students sitting down and doing a worksheet worksheet in every single subject. You're going to give kids opportunities to write and you're going to give kids opportunities to draw. And you're going to give kids opportunities to maybe record themselves or to give an oral presentation or to make a collage. All of those activities, as long as you're paying attention to the kind of resources that families have at home, all of those activities are still things that can work in um, uh, when you're giving students asynchronous assignments. The, the other, the, there are two other things that I'd encourage schools to think about there. 
I will tell you that it is against our advice right now in a time of crisis to think about having synchronous and asynchronous. We are encouraging schools to think about that's a that's a change you may make two to three to four weeks from now. Our advice, though, is to move totally to a distance learning platform right now, in part to keep the technology simple and to make sure that there is continuity across your school. So that does run counter to that. I just want to flag that um, uh, uh, advice. The second thing is. There actually, just last week or two weeks ago, there was a really good research report about screen time. I know that this is starting to become a concern within uh, schools and communities um, that notes that it's not an issue of screen time. And a number of studies have been pointing toward this for a while, that it's not an issue of actual time in front of a screen. It's an issue about what kids are doing on that screen. Um, so please keep that in mind. It's not screen time generally. It's what they're doing with uh, the engagement with that screen. Um, our good one schoolhouse friend, Lisa Demore, was on CBS this morning talking about this just last week. If you Google Lisa, CBS Demore, or screen time, you're gonna find this really nice five minute link and it could be something that you wanna share with your families. And I know we actually link to it in our classes too. Um, all right, Brad, we have a question. I know you've talked about this before. Have you talked about or do you have advice or best practices for pulling back expectations for covering curriculum? Yeah, it's that is one of those thorny things that I think almost falls in that same area of, um, of you know, are you moving to pass fail or something like that? It, it's the type of question you don't have any answers to right now as administrators. You, you know where it might be going and you're worried about it and it's something you should be thinking about, but it's probably not something you can make any decisions about. I think that it's so fair to say that um, if you're talking to your external community, your parents, families, et cetera, about this type of stuff, you're probably saying, listen, this is an issue that is on our radar right now. And we are working with our faculty to prioritize the core of our academic program as it stands right now. Then with your faculty, and for faculty, you should be thinking about how am I prioritizing the core of my academic program right now? What can I potentially think about taking out that's not, that's are the kind of nice to haves in my program and not core to what I'm doing. This is another reason that, again, I would encourage you to think about whether you're running your special classes during the first couple of weeks. You want to see, are kids actually able to cover similar amounts of content? Are kids able to do some of these things right now? And then you can make some of those decisions down the road. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um, we have a question. Um, from a school that's moving, to, that's shifted to distance learning, and they would like to survey students, faculty, and faculty at the end of the first week. Um, what's the most important information to collect, and do you have any um, samples or platforms that you'd recommend? You know, Liz, we, we do this a lot at One Schoolhouse, right? And I think that we actually find that the best information we get is some of the open, uh, is some of the open discussion area information, and just letting people have a chance to uh to to tell you what's going right and what's going wrong right what, what's going really well just ask start with those questions what's going really well and what isn't going really well um, from where you sit and then make sure that that data that you're collecting is accessible to a wide range of administrators who are making policy decisions this is actually interesting so liz and i at when when we pull our kids two weeks in um liz and i and our whole academic administration reads every comment from every kid. That's not usual in our independent school world. In this time, prioritize that. Take the time to read every comment on what's going well and what's not going well from every kid and from every family. You're gonna learn a ton there um, just by asking those simple questions. Yeah, and then a couple of nuts and bolts recommendations. Um, we find SurveyMonkey is really useful because it's easy to filter the information. And what that means is that you can filter it. If you ask families to fill it out separately for each child, you can see all of your third grade responses, and then you can send those to your third grade teacher very easily. Um, so I would encourage you to, to consider that platform. Um, we also think it's really important when we do those two week in surveys to ask students how long they're spending on their work. Um, you'll know if you want to do that sort of day by day or granularly, uh, more granularly, depending on the age of the student. 
Um, but getting that information to see if what you think you're doing is actually what's happening um, on the ground, that's really useful information. Um, and likewise, we also always ask our students about the challenge level. Is this class about as challenging as you expected? Is it more challenging? Is it less challenging? I mean, so just a few of those really, um, the open-ended questions are really important because that's where you get sort of like the meat of the, of the information you're gonna use to iterate. But those short questions are really important just to make sure that what you hoped happens is actually what's happening. Um, and we use that information. Sometimes we'll find out that we're going to see the kids are spending significantly less time than we expected. We want our teachers to know that. Um, it may mean that they just have a lot of kids who go really fast. That's fine. But it's really it, because you don't have your usual tools for getting feedback when you're online, you need to ask explicitly. Um, Let's move on here um, to um, another qu quick question um, that's still big picture, which is that um, in the, hold on, I'm just scanning through this. Um, I, give me one second here, I'm losing track of things. There we go, that's what I was looking for. Um, do we have any resources for basic comportment during synchronous classes, the balance of sharing and listening, um, how to help students uh, sort of uh, responsible use, uh, respect um, and courtesy? Um, what, what do we recommend to our teachers when we're doing those sorts of things, Brad? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Liz. And, and I, I'm so glad this was asked because one of the first things that you wanna do with kids the first time you meet them in a synchronous setting is establish and or reestablish the ground rules that you have and the expectations that you have for courtesy and respect of classmates in different settings. The good thing is that most teachers already have this type of thing and have done this type of expectation setting back in August or September. So pull that back out and, and kind of start there and you know take 15 minutes to frame Yes, these same types of rules apply. These same types of guidelines apply. And engage the kids, especially as the, if they're older kids, in thinking through what other types of guidelines you may want to have in this new environment. So think carefully about that. The kids are often really good at this themselves. Secondarily, there are some things that you're going to want to think about uh, in the online case and help set as school-wide ground rules, right? So one of the ground rules that we encourage schools to think about to the best that they can, knowing that this is uh, a, an, a recommendation that not every kid and not every family is going to be able to follow, but to the best that you can, don't allow the computer and don't allow that synchronous classroom to happen in a bedroom. Encourage families to think about public spaces in their houses where kids should be doing that. I understand that that gets really complicated if you're a New York City family and you have two parents working at home and three kids all trying to do online classes at the same time. Totally get it. Um, but to the best you can, try to have that type of guideline. Also help the kids understand how they're presenting themselves on camera, right? Make sure that they're in school dress. Make sure your teachers are in school dress. Have them think about the background that's behind them, the lighting that's coming in. All of those things can be helpful in this environment. And my guess is a lot of the kids are picking up on this, and so engaging them and setting those ground rules could be helpful to schools. Um, in addition, probably a lot of you have classroom expectations. Um, uh, in lower school, you may have set those with students as classroom agreements, and in upper schools, you may have, you've probably had those conversations in the first week or two of school. Um, and so remind students that those are the expectations that they set about how they want to be treated and how they want to treat each other. Those things are true whether you are online or whether you're face-to-face -face in the classroom. Yep. Um, Brad, we had one more question about the PD courses, which is, um, it said, I'm an administrator that would like to help teachers with distant learning. Should I sign up for planning for administrators or for teachers? Sign up for planning for administrators. We're going to make sure that the teacher pages are accessible so that you know what we're saying to teachers too. All right. Um, and then um, we have a question. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel you on this. How do we support teachers who have their own small or not so small children at home to supervise while they're being asked to teach synchronous classes? This is one of those areas that don't let perfect be the enemy of good in this situation, right? We are working through a situation that is very difficult and different. 
and another reason that you may want to think about having some of your special teachers reserved as uh, as uh, substitute teachers for really challenging situations in this in this case. Um, so this is an area where you know it, it used to be fairly common in independent schools for teachers to sometimes bring their children into class if their kids were off of school for the day. Uh, uh, you know, if their kids were in a public school system and the kids were off, but the, the independent school was going on, it used to be fairly common for teachers to have that scenario and bring them into the classroom. We're kind of moving back to that uh, as a new norm for right now, too. Don't you think, Liz? Yeah, and I'll just let me give you some really specific parenting tips that I've developed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, so first of all, if you know that you've got a video call, um, don't have your kids, if you can avoid it, don't have your kids do schoolwork. Like, pick that time to do the thing they love whether it's Legos or Tetris or playing hoops outside um, in your driveway. So, so for those times you don't want to be interrupted, give them something to do that they don't want to stop doing. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know what, this is messy. This is messy for all of us. And letting your students see that it's messy is okay. Um, I will have video calls where my cat will show up on my desk and you'll just sort of see this tail going like this across the screen. And you know what? In a perfect world, that wouldn't happen. And sometimes it does. And we keep going and it's fine. It's fine. We'll all, we'll all live. And one of the silver linings of this is going to be that we're all going to see each other as a little bit more human. And we're going to all get a little bit more of a peek into the complexity of our lives. And I really do believe that's going to build a lot of empathy and flexibility. It won't always feel great or be fun getting there. Um, but I think in the big picture, it's all going to be fine. Um, totally agree. Right. We also had a question that I'm going to answer quickly um, about, um, and then we're going to move on to some of the more specific questions about. Uh, I think your cat was right on cue with that. Yeah, she heard her being recognized there. Yeah, I'm going to ask this question, then I'm going to go let her out of my office. Um, so the question was about recording Zooms um, and, um, and what do we recommend um, in terms of recording uh, synchronous sessions? I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, so the nice thing is in a lot of these different platforms, it's pretty darn easy to record uh, the sessions. Um, and a little bit of this is uh, platform specific. And so I think it's a good thing for your technology offices at your schools to be considering as you choose the platform. Zoom, for example, is super easy to record and you can record it so that it uh, it appears on your own computer or so that it appears in the cloud and you can just send along a Zoom link. Um, and, and it's as easy literally as pushing the record button when you start the session. Um, but it is something you're gonna wanna make sure you flag for your IT office at school as you choose the platform that you're gonna use. On that note, something I didn't say earlier, I would absolutely encourage central administration of uh, whatever video platform you use and that you use one platform for your entire school that you're not giving people choice. Again, simplicity is your friend. Use one platform here across the whole school. Um, the other reason to use one platform is because you have students who are probably working with multiple teachers and it's gonna be, it's hard enough to learn one platform. Um, if you're asking them to learn three or four, um, you're just increasing the amount of time that you're going to have to spend tech troubleshooting and tech troubleshooting absolutely a fair amount of time. Um, so similar to that, we've got another question, which is what are some good guidelines for first timers who may be creating their very first video lessons to deliver? Yeah. Um, so it, advice here depends a little bit. Um, if you're doing that in a synchronous session like this, simplify your teaching. And, uh, and bring it down to its essences as best as possible. If you're used to running classroom discussions in in-person settings, run classroom discussions in the online setting like this. Um, you know, really just think about how am I transferring the pedagogical approach from my classroom to the online setting. If your school is asking you to create videos that you would then post for asynchronous discussion, our advice is a little bit different. First piece of advice would be for a lot of schools, that's probably a bridge too far and a skill too much for this time right now. That again, that's the type of skill that we might be thinking about for the future. That said, it's relatively easy to do in the greater scheme of things. And one of Liz's suggestions from earlier of a second grade teacher reading a book to kids and sending that video out, literally we're just taking the video recording and trying to do that and holding that book up there. 
when you start to get into more complexity is if you're asking teachers to teach a skill via video and then have kids be able to transfer that skill to learning. There are a whole bunch of different guidelines that we've used from the online world that we train our teachers on. I will tell you that that takes teachers some time to learn that skill well. I'll give you one simple example of that. No kid watches a video that's longer than five minutes long. And so breaking things down into components like that um, is, is something, again, why we'd say that's probably a bridge too far for most teachers right now and something that we'd want to increase skills capacity on um, either as the spring goes on or after we're through this crisis. This is another one of those things where you'll see actually some really good tutorials online. They won't be necessarily for teachers, but the best practices in online teaching are really the best practices for creating good informational videos. So go yeah, it's content go, creation. Yep. Go, go Google, go Google diving. Um, you'll find some good stuff there. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me now um, push into some pretty specific questions. Um, and um, I think we may answer them on a broader, um, on a broader stage than, than the specific people are asking for, but um, I think that, that we'll probably be able to give you some good, um, good directions to go in. So the first is, um, if, will the recording be available? Yes, we're going to post this um, right on our um, oneschoolhouse.org slash covid-19.html page. Yep. Um, and then the next question is, um, how do we send, handle sending packets, activities, and worksheets for families that do not have a printer? Um, good question. Um, the first thing is, um, is consider mail. It's not a great option, but it's there. Um, it's slow, so you need to do a different kind of um, planning. Um, they think also about the directions that you can provide online that kids can then do on paper. So you may want to sort of give a give written directions for something that students then do on paper. Um, in terms of submitting work, and this was a qu another question that came up, is that, that um, what's the best way, this was a specific question about like math work. Um, smartphones have great free scanner apps. You take your phone, you take a picture of a piece of paper, it automatically converts it to a PDF and you mail it in. Um, they're very, they're surprisingly high resolution. Um, don't, don't have kids take it like with their, with their, with their uh, camera app um, or a photo app, but these scanners work really, really well. Um, they're low or no cost um, and they're, they're remarkably efficient. Great. Anything hey, else? Liz, Yep. No, I, I'm just going to know we're running up against the hour here and we are going to end this in two minutes just to make sure that we keep this um, short enough uh, for Great. people to be able to review in the future too. And good news, we have only two more questions. Um, Great. So the first is um, what discussion boards do you recommend? This was a specific question was middle school English language arts, but I'm going to open that up to discussion boards in general. I would say whatever the discussion board that is within the learning management system of your school and in use there, if there isn't one, I would have that conversation with your tech department and probably not add it in here at the beginning. But most schools are using a learning management system that does have a discussion board built in. Please do not go outside of that discussion board to do that because again, we're trying to create continuity um, and simplicity uh, for our kids. That may be one of those things that you're adding in a couple of weeks along the way. Okay, um, we've got a question here. What recommendations um, do you have for those of us who teach conversation-based classes? Yeah, Liz, do you wanna to talk to folks for just a second about how this works within our, our One Schoolhouse courses? And this is probably gonna be the last question that we answer here today. Yeah. Um, so the, in terms of conversation based classes, um, the first thing is using something like this. Um, we have this set up as a webinar, but you can set up a zoom meeting where everybody can talk. That's the, that is the most transparent and easiest thing to do. Um, the other option is to have students record themselves. Again, they use smartphones or they use a webcam in their device and, um, and then they can post those, um, uh, on a web page, they can email them to you, but it's a way to get students talking and not always writing. Um, and that brings forward different students because you're tapping into those different modalities of learning. Um, it can be useful to ask students all the same question and have them um, record themselves um, and post that um, and then send those around to their friends or share them. Um, it's one of those places where you're also gonna find what works well 
you guys, you are all competent, thoughtful teachers and you know what works well in your classroom practice. And I would encourage you to try to think about what the closest way is to duplicate that in a synchronous online space. Yeah, and again, I, I, we just continue to end with this. Um, be simple with your solutions here. Make tweaks as you go along, but be real simple with those initial solutions. I think everybody in your community is gonna be really thankful for that. On that note, just remember that we're gonna, we're gonna be posting this up on our YouTube channel and we're gonna be creating a link there uh, and a link for all the different types of resources that we're creating on oneschoolhouse.org slash COVID-19. Um, thank you so much for your participation and uh, let us know how we can help additionally. Bye everyone.